Sorry about this, everybody. Perhaps something has pushed over the Gauri repeater, just like the elephants have pushed over this marula tree. Our technical team is rushing around, madly trying to fix it, and we'll be back with you as soon as we can. Thanks. Sorry about that. Uh, we've now come ahead to where I thought the hyenas were moving. And so far, I can't see anything here. There is a little water hole. But I think there's a strong possibility there's something happening in those thickets there. It's always good to switch off and listen. Your ears often find animals before your eyes. But nothing just yet. So I think our plan is we're going to keep on our, our little route through here. And then maybe when it's a bit lighter, I might come back and have a little walk on foot through there. See if we can find anything there. So I haven't found any tracks here yet. So I am going to head towards Mvubu Road. And that's where the lionesses were sleeping yesterday. And see if maybe their tracks have come further to the south. It is overcast, quite windy today. Now, of course, if you're a big cat, this is great hunting weather. And it's been like this for a few hours. So there's always a good chance that maybe a lion or a leopard managed to secure itself a meal. Ryan, you see any tracks on that favored path over there? Nothing cat-like. Seems that everything's happening around the center of Juma at the moment, around the lodges. There was Sindile, Karula, and the two Nkahuma lionesses, all within a very close proximity to each other. And we've got these two hyenas with their tails up moving around here. Now, they must have heard something we didn't. Now, while we brave this cold weather in search of the big cats, let's go see how James is in his nice, warm, toasty tent. Describing this as a toasty, warm tent, everybody, is a gross exaggeration. I've got a, I've got a jersey on. There's a wind blowing through. We've only got one side closed. It is quite toasty in front of this light, though. Very nice. All right, my name is James Hendry, if you're wondering. Uh, David is on camera today. Eugene is knocking about outside trying to fix various technical things. We're setting ourselves up, of course, for TV. That's why I was underneath the desk there. I have various things to try and sort out. But while you ha we have you there, now, of course, every time I come into my little museum here, it has been moved around by people with aesthetically more experienced eyes. Uh, you know, I put everything where I could find them, but apparently this was unacceptable. And so now I can't find anything in my tent. But what I can find is this amazing hyena skull. And there are two things about the skull that are interesting. First of all, the fact that the actual jaw there does not belong to... Now they've taken the jaw. Here it is. Good grief, it's irritating. Okay, so here we are. This particular jaw belongs to this particular hyena and what Brent's talking about when he says that they're going to be scavenging along of course is he's absolutely right they will be scavenging and their teeth are specially adapted for scavenging and getting the most of nutrients from food that has perhaps already been devoured by other larger predators or faster predators and what I want you to look at there is the obvious carnassial shear now I'm going to turn the teeth like this these teeth are called carnassials, the molars 
There we can see them. And you can see how this very aged hyena has worn away its teeth. And you can see how it would be extremely effective for cutting meat from skin or bone or chopping something like a, um, like a ligament in half. And also, just have a look here, Dave, at these two front canines and see how the top one has been occluded, horribly occluded. Well, not horribly, but certainly this was not a young hyena when it succumbed to whatever killed it. But you can see how the top canine has been rubbed and shaped by the bottom one, the constant chewing and chewing. You can also see the different parts of the teeth there. You can see the enamel, that's the sort of plain white bit there, and underneath starting to be exposed the dentine of this hyena. So that is the uh, teeth. Those are the teeth of the spotted hyena. And of course, the spotted hyena being the only animal that is able to crush a bone like that. Very few other animals could do that unless they have a tool. And of course, that's one of the things that we as human beings are very clever at doing. That's using tools. Now, uh, operating with a tool out in the bush at the moment, a tool is a very small sort of stick, he's uh, now doing a bit of a pole dance next to a stump. Let's go and find out what Steph Winterboer's plans are for the morning on foot. Good morning. Good morning to this wonderful, wonderful, cloudy, basically sunrise bushwalk safari. We're on safari with myself, Steph Winterboer, and Jean Reyes on camera with us today. Now, our plan for today is to just walk around in an area close to Cheetah Cut Line. And what we come here for is nothing really. I haven't got a faintest idea what we're going to find here today. There's no clue giving me any idea as to elephant or lion or leopard in the area. But with a windy day like today, things have been moving during the night. I mean, I'm sure you've been enjoying those hyena with, with Brent there. Um, but to start off with, I just want to show you something. I very rarely bypass a big tree. And this is one of the biggest of this particular species that I've seen on the reserve to date. This is a zebra wood, a mature zebra wood. And one of the hardest trees that we found out here. In, other, it, it, in actual fact, it's probably the second hardest tree we have here. And I'm going to give you a little demonstration as to how hard this thing is. Now, most trees you can move by just pushing them a little bit. Have a look at how hard this guy is. <laughs> They're just... Absolutely no movement in that tree whatsoever. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> to be honest with you, there isn't even... The <laughs> uh, we're all very funny today. I think we're gearing up for this, for this afternoon's big show and for the weekend. Now, what I enjoy about this is the fact that its wood is pitch black. It's got the heartwood here. This is its heartwood. And you can see how hard it is even to get little shavings off of here. Now traditionally, these pieces of stump were used for implement handles because they're very, very termite resistant. But this little shaving of wood, if you had to drop it into a glass of water, it, it's so dense, it wouldn't even float. Can you believe that, hey? And you can see how shiny that is. It's literally just showing you that very, very fine grain of the zebra wood. Modern uses for it are in knife sets, knife handles, bowls, intricate inlays into tables, are all done with this type of zebra wood. You can buy it, it's very rare and it's quite expensive, but you can. But anyway, nice tree. I quite enjoy saying hello to these old trees, you know. We go along, come along, let's see what else we can find. Now, we are moving, uh, ah, before we go into that, there's hyena on quarantine that you need to go and see. We'll catch up with you later. There are some hyena here, somebody, everybody, but we've managed to uh, not see them anymore. Where did they go? Now, uh, of course, we are in the middle of the bush here, as are Steph and Brent. And the hyenas will be circling around here just to kind of get an idea of what we're doing. I'm not sure where they went. David, did you see what d direction they went? They're probably heading off to the final control to see if they can get some scraps from there. I'm just going to look around here. 
No, I'm afraid they seem to have disappeared entirely. Anyway, there are definitely there's some, something going on because they've been knocking about here for the last 20 minutes or so. And what they're after, I'm not sure. But there was a wildebeest knocking around as well and he was kind of um, alarm calling during the course of the morning. But now he's gone. We'll have, try and find them again, everyone. While we do that, uh, let's head back to Brent and find out what he's doing. Whip. We're carrying on now. We've left that area. The hyenas are still around. And I know James and the guys at the tent will be keeping the air out if they hear anything that would warrant us rushing back into that area. So we know Karula brought her cubs north across onto Juma. So she is going to be going back there at some point. So I'm going to go down towards the southern boundary and I'm just going to start checking that area very carefully. If we find where she possibly has hidden the cubs, we've got a very good chance of finding her as well. She will be returning to that area. So Taxon, who's the guide at Juma, is going in from the western side and I'm coming in from the eastern side. And hopefully between the two of us, we'll be able to have some luck with Queen Karula, the dominant female leopard of Juma. But of course, we're not only in search of the big hairies and scaries. We love all the animals from the minutest to the largest. And whatever we may find will be just as exciting. Oh, we have a red block. An old buffalo bull. Hello, mister. This is really an, not a great place to, to, to rest at. There we go. Now, normally there's another one or two around in the bush. Sometimes they are alone. He's already got an early morning ox pecker on him. <laughs> he doesn't look like he wants to move for us at all. Ruminating, chewing the cud. We're going to find a way around this big boy. While we do that, let's jump back on, or not jump back on, let's go back to the cozy tent with James. There they are, everyone. They're walking across quarantine clearings here. You can see their tails are cocked up. And their tails are cocked up because they are either sort of being territorial, they maybe had some conflict with another clan, they look big enough to be females, or they are, have been fighting with each other over food. They don't look like they've been fighting, they look like they've been after something, they've been scavenging, and so that kind of tension has made them stick their tails up like that. And it's when they walk like this, I find, with their tails cocked up like that, that they look so unlike dogs. And many people say they look like dogs, but that, that kind of characteristic tail up and it flared out, to me, always looks completely hyena. Not cat, not dog, not any other kind of animal but hyena. Something's going on here. As Brent says, there could be a drag mark, maybe they stole from a leopard, maybe they stole from a lion. We should actually be keeping an eye in the trees here for the draped carcass, perhaps, of an antelope. But I don't see anything now. Davy, have you still got the Mises or they're gone? I think they've gone behind that large termite mound there. They're heading off in a westerly direction. And you can see Tax on there, maybe. He's following them on game drive. Sundile was around here the other uh, yesterday. Not too far from here at all. Maybe he killed something in the night. Yeah, we can't see them anymore. They're just d over the top of the ridge here. We could sort of approach them on foot if we wanted to, but Dave's, are, of course, attached bodily to the tent. All 
right here. We'll keep an eye on what's going on out here. But while we do that, let's go back to Steph and see where he is knocking about on foot. We will also, of course, have the rover around at some stage during the morning. See you later. Welcome back to the bushwalk with myself, Steph. We've been basically finding a drainage line that I've, I know of in this area, and we're slowly making our way down this drainage line. But I stopped at this little grove of Waltheria. This is a Waltheria bush, and they, we have been very, very lucky with Waltherias in terms of finding creepy crawlies, my favorite type of thing to look for. And so what I'm going to do is just go with you as I comb through these Waltheria plants. You can see me twisting it. And that's because I'd really want to get underneath the leaf to see what is there. Carefully inspect all of the little flower heads for these quite delicate and sometimes very camouflaged spiders that we're finding. For those of you lucky enough to have watched yesterday, we found a crab spider, not on a Waltheria, but it was quite close to one. It doesn't seem like much is over here right now. So we go on to the next bush. That's basically how the bushwalk goes, from one patch of interesting looking bush to another. One thing I did want to try out with you today was a technique for catching, um, for catching rabbits. Now, part of what we do out here is, is really learning a little bit about how uh, our ancestors used to live off of the land. And it's, it's, for some reason, I find it quite fascinating, as I'm sure you do as well. There's just this interest in how did people get on in this bush? How long did they live here? How did they manage with all the, all the harshness of this particular environment? One of, the, one of the best tricks is rabbit hunting. Now this is a stick from a sandpaper raisin. They grow long and straight as you can see all the way down here. <coughs> now they were harvested and then they were joined together with bits of bark twine. And then at the end of one of these bark twines was placed a fork stick. Now, obviously not from a guari bush, which is what I'm gonna be doing here. Something a little bit more robust, but this guari stick is gonna let me do what I wanna show you. <coughs> Excuse me. So at the end, you place a fork stick. Right. So basically what it would look like is this long stick here, and there would be your forked stick attached with a piece of bark. And the theory is that you then probe holes. In this area, the rabbits don't have holes, but have scrapes. But in very, very common around these areas are rock hyrax and spring hair. And this definitely works for them. So you probe their with a forked stick like this, and you need a bit of body to do this, and unfortunately the only hair I've got on the eyes of my wrists, I'm not going to rip my shirt off for you. What I am going to do is show you the theory behind this. You then twirl it, and until it catches, and then you pull the rabbit out of the hole using the forked stick. Twist it, catches in the hair and then you pull the rabbit out of the hole or you pull the rock hyrax out of the hole using the stick as you can see now I didn't really catch in my hair there I probably could do it on my arm here a little bit I've made my sticks too big see there then you pull the rabbit out of the hole he comes with following the stick and then dinner is caught. That is a survival lesson. Let's call that 201 because it's quite a higher grade survival lesson. There. Catching rock hyrax or rabbits using a forked stick. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and without further ado, I think it would be a good idea to send you out to Brent who's got an update for you. <laughs> Good news, it looks like this cold front might be a, a, a pseudo cold front and it's breaking up. We're getting some blue sky coming through. We're now getting quite close to the southern edge of Juma. And I'm really hoping 
that we don't find any tracks in this area, and I'm hoping Tax finds tracks further in Juman. Now, I think she's either got the, the cubs in this system behind us, or the system's here, but I just want to double check this road, make sure that she hasn't done a disappearing act. As we know, Karula, the dominant female leopard here, is very good at disappearing. Now, I just got an update about Sindile. Now, I'm not 100% sure how true it is or uh, how accurate it is, but I'm, I'm pretty certain it's from a, quite a reliable source. But he has probably moved over 20 kilometers since yesterday into the Manuleti. So he's out of Juma now and actually really long gone. Uh, there's a, a lodge up there called Honey Guide. That's apparently where he is. And I think that's as the crow flies straight line over 20 kilometers. So uh, very interesting to see if that's true. Because if that is, he's moved a massive distance since we saw him yesterday. So far, no tracks, which is a good thing. Normally, we're always in search of tracks, but I'm hoping not to find tracks in this area this morning. We have a, a special request from Arcadia. And uh, it's a story I've told, so a lot of our regulars will have heard it. But Arcadia is, says, I have to share it with the new viewers. It was a riot. Now, the story is, my guide was eaten by a lion. I used to work about 70 kilometers that way. Uh, about 10 years ago or so, in a private concession within the Kruger National Park. Now, when we got to that area, it was very, very, very new open up. A lot of the animals were quite skittish and, and, and used to run away from the vehicle. So we used to track on foot a lot. And we had an incredible pride that Natio actually made a documentary on called the Mega Pride. We used to call them the Mountain Pride. At one stage, they got to over 40 lions. And they used to live on the basalt plains leading up to the Lobombo Mountains. And one of the most amazing trackers I've ever worked with in my life, a, a man by the name of Glass Marmani and myself found tracks of this pride. And what happens normally when you're on a safari with, with guests is that I'll have my rifle and there'll obviously be a tracker seat up front and we'll say to the guests, we're just going to leave you here in the shade for a little bit. Uh, Glass and I are going to go for a quick walk. As a guide, you're not normally ever gone for longer than 20 minutes. If you think the tracking is going to take longer, you leave the rifle with your tracker and you walk back to the vehicle and you drive around, you talk to him on the radio, find out where to meet him. So we were on a ridge like this and the road's there. We stopped under a nice tree so the guests didn't get sunburned. And we walked down into a little river system. And on the other side of the river system is a, a series of uh, what we call sodic sites, so thick quarry bushes and open patches. And the tracks went down into the river and popped out into these thick quarries. So we're going quite slowly. And then as we sort of popped out of the thickets and about 70 meters away, uh, there was the mountain pride. But this time they had two males with them that had come, that we didn't see very often. They'd come from north of our concession. And there's a very simple rule about lions. A noisy lion charging you is a safe lion, a quiet lion is a dangerous lion. And these two male lions got up and came silently. Glass my tracker starts shouting, do what I've do what I've shoot them, shoot them. And I was like, ah, ah, throw rocks at them. And uh, our language took a real big dive. We used some choice words at the, at the lions. 
But it, uh, they stopped at about, I think about just under six feet from us. I mean, we got dust and everything spraying up onto us. And uh, hello, Impalas. And we were, we were, we were, we were, we were not feeling quite confident when you've got lions literally right next to you. And you have a system when you work with a tracker, especially in the area there where we used to get charged by lions and stuff a lot, where they're not used to people uh, or vehicles, is that when you're on foot and you've got your rifle up now, your tracker slips his finger through your belt and he leads you out so you can keep focused on whatever the danger is. And uh, well, we threw glass through some rocks at the lions. I was shouting at the lions and using some bad language at their, in their general direction. But it took us about 25 minutes to get out of there because every time we took a step back, they'd come forward again, charging, growling. Now the guests, although they couldn't see us, were probably no more than 100 meters. So all they could hear was all this shouting and now once the lions had stopped their charge, all this growling. And uh, like we have our, our earpieces here, we had earpieces there, and um, we had an American lady on the vehicle, and she uh, could just hear lions growling and us shouting, but grabbed the radio, but couldn't figure out that there was an earpiece into it, so she couldn't hear what we were saying back. So she grabbed the game drive radio, and, and, and shouted, my God, my God, my guest, my, my guy's been eaten by a lion, my guy's been eaten by a lion. Obviously that caused major panic through the rest of the guiding team. Everyone starts rushing up to the north and uh, eventually Glass and I managed to get out of that situation and, and, and we were completely fine till we got back to the car. And I, I, I remember I opened the rifle, took the round out, made the, the firearm safe, closed it, put it in its case, and then my hands just went and I couldn't even speak, it was just shaking and uh, my tracker glass couldn't even get into the car, he was just missing the step the whole time and, <laughs> and then uh, there, was, there was also a British couple on the vehicle and she piped out from like, Brent, Brent my dear, I really didn't enjoy the language you were using from there and I, I didn't, at that moment I didn't realise she was joking, she was joking <laughs> But here we are, that was a, my guide was eaten by a lion. Obviously everyone rushed up there, complete panic, and then eventually managed to get on the radar. So guy's fine. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a very, we had a very nice lion sighting after that. We drove the car through and sat with them for a good hour afterwards. But there we go, Arcadia. My guide was eaten by a lion story for you. That's probably, possibly one of the worst charges I've faced in South Africa from a lion on foot. But I think we're, let's move away from lions and go to Steph, who's got something that's not nearly as scary as a lion. Welcome back to the bushwalk. And for those of you who have just joined us, I'm Steph and we're on foot walking in the middle of the Kruger National Park here with everyone else. And one of my favorite pastimes is lifting up pieces of bark and chunks of wood to see what creepy crawlies are underneath it. And underneath here is a special surprise just for you. It's the first time in an age that I've seen one of these. They're not particularly rare, but they are here. That is a wood louse. Oh, sorry about that. There seems to have been a little little gremlin crawling around in the bushwalk. So you're back with us. So we're checking the southern boundary. I'm leaving Tax to check around Treehouse Dam. And he's got Fanuti, his tracker. So if he does find any fresh tracks, he's able to put Fanuti on those. Now, there is a possibility those lions have moved further to the east. There is the Inkahuma who's got cubs here at the moment. And we're going to go check along our eastern boundary and see if we can find any tracks or any sign of anything there. Uh, no tracks here, that's good. We want tracks coming this way, not going that way.
Now this is a, one of our best roads for finding tracks. It's really nice and sandy. It sits up on the ridge here. So we don't have to strain the eyes too much to see the leopard and lion prints. So there were tracks of a male lion in this area yesterday, on yesterday's sunrise safari. Now, these Birmingham boys have been moving up and down and all around, so there's always a possibility they might make an appearance. Oh, he looks like Steph's uh, back, and he's got that very, very fearsome wood louse to show you. All right, so we've managed to fix our little glitch that we had over there. We figured out we lent a little bit too far over with the backpack, and that's why you left us so suddenly. But let's go down over here to go and show you exactly what we were looking at. As you left us, we had found a wood louse. Now, wood louse have babies and this is a mommy and have a look at all her babies isn't that cool she's a detritivore so that means that she eats detritus fungus and algae are her main foods oh you've left some of your kids behind where are you going and those are baby woodlouse isn't that awesome ah oh, there they're going following mom <laughs> that's very cute I've never ever in 20 years seen a baby woodlouse, and there we go, first time ever. We've also got something else interesting here, and that is three casks from a mud dauber wasp. Now what that means is that this little wasp has collected mud from somewhere and come and built these funny pottery jars. They're called potter's wasps or mud dauber wasps. Inside each of these pottery jars is a caterpillar that she would, after, ha after having built this chamber, she would fly around, find a caterpillar, sting the caterpillar, but not kill it, just paralyze it, push it into this cavity, and then lay an egg on it. What happens then is actually quite bizarre and quite macabre. But the, 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 the wasp larvae is carnivorous and hatches on the caterpillar and then starts to eat it, but eats all the non-essential tissues first, and then all the appendages, and eventually when that wasp's larvae is ready to pupate, it will eat the rest of that caterpillar alive. And then it pupates and comes out of that little pottery jar as a wasp to begin the whole cycle over again. Isn't that amazing? Scary, macabre. Imagine if that was on a scale that we're at, I think we'd be stuffed into one of these jars with a wasp caterpillar, well, a wasp larvae eating us, but don't like it. I can't see anything in there. It looks like they had a clay seal. You can see this one over here. It's got a little cap that's been opened. I actually think that these are old jars in which the wasp has actually left. Now towards the end of the season, that does happen. Right. So... Let me see if I can open up one of these jars and we can see what's inside of it. You can see the mud. That was the chamber. It is empty. You can see right inside there. No more wasp, no more caterpillar, that was all eaten. Wasp has flown away. And that's basically that for that little mud dauber or pottery wasp. Many different kinds of pottery wasps, many different kinds of shapes of pottery jars, many different types of and sizes of caterpillar that they feed on. And obviously, as much as it sounds a little bit macabre, you can't have all the, all the moth and butterfly larvae. You can't have all the caterpillars eating all the leaves. 
and Mother Nature has put in a nice check and a balance there. She introduced this wasp. These wasps are they furiously busy building these little pottery jars and collecting caterpillars and that way Mother Nature keeps a balance, an equilibrium out here. Not too many caterpillars eating all the leaves, not too many wasps uh, eating all the caterpillars basically. Always this relationship with one another. James likes to refer to it as being constantly in flux and never in equilibrium. Um, for me, I like to think that um, everything is in a state of flux. I'm in accord with James on that actually. I, I quite agree with his statement there. It's either too much or too little. There's no such thing as too much or too little. It is just part of the range of things just staying in equilibrium here. But back onto this wood lice, Jeff has asked me, good morning Jeff, um, you've asked me all the way from Arizona as far as I can remember in my ear, um, isn't the wood lice a type of cockroach? And you're 100% right. The wood lice along with the termite is a type of cockroach, absolutely, and they feed on the detritus, they feed on the, the rotting vegetation that, that, it, that happens after elephants have been through an area and given mother nature a little bit of time to start to decompose all of this area here. But if you'd like to see her again, I think it wouldn't do any harm to turn this around. They're actually quite fantastic creatures. Them and horseshoe crabs are some of the oldest creatures on terrestrial creatures, and I mean creatures that have climbed out of the sea, that we find, there she is there, and she houses her babies underneath her. Can you see her there? I'll point her out with my finger. There we go. Relying on camouflage, all her mouth parts are underneath that camouflage shell so that she can eat without having to move any external part and become prey to something. She's quite soft bodied, she doesn't have, she doesn't have a hard exoskeleton. Let's see if we can turn her around so you can see where her babies lie. There her babies are underneath there. That's how she keeps them safe. And there two little critters have gone into search of some hiding over there. No harm done, she'll go and collect them very, very soon. Fascinating how camouflage she is, eh? Nice. Let's turn this around so that she's not exposed at all. Put it right back where we found it. Right. While I carry on looking for more interesting critters to show you, I'm sure James has got something exciting to tell you in that tent of his. Hey everyone, there's kind of a bit of a behind the scenes look at what's going on here at the moment. The rover is up, so if you have a look now, that was brilliant, Kirsten, very fast, well done. There's the rover feed. It's looking at the water hole. Unfortunately, the rover has gone rogue. Now, what that means is that every time we tell it to move anywhere, it goes forward, and that's what it does. It doesn't stop going forward. And we had a rather disturbing period. We had that picture that you can see in front of you now, and we drove the rover forward from the tent here, and it kept going, and we had to yell down the radio to Connor to rush down there and pick it up before it drove itself into the water. Anyway, that's the story of the rover, and with any luck, we'll have it up and running fairly soon. Next, of course, is this rather splendid new microscope, and what I wanted to do was show you a tortoise, not a tortoise, a spider, which has now been moved. Geraldine keeps, Geraldine keeps, um, keeps tidying up after me, you see. I can't find anything in here anymore. Where's my spider? Banded, but no, it's, no, no, no. I'm going to give her a thorough talking to just now. Anyway, let's not do the spider. We'll have a look at a weevil instead. The spider's kind of crucial to me stories. All right, here's a weevil. Let me just give Davy a chance to look at the weevil. The weevil, of course, is now starting to rot, and uh, it's not very tasteful. But it will eventually go hard, and then it won't rot anymore. But this spanky new microscope, we're going to have a look at the weevil's mouthparts. And a weevil's mouthparts, of course, 
utterly terrifying because they look like the mouth parts of an alien. Indeed, the entire weevil resembles an alien in many respects. Let me just uh, focus in on this chap before you go to him. Now, let's drop this down. And there you go. So that, everybody, is the weevil's mouth parts. I'm just not sure about the light on him. Hang on one sec. Come back to me, Kirst. I'll just quickly get a light. Stand by. Davey, don't go anywhere. I'm coming back now, Dave. I'm on my way. I'm on my way back, Dave. Fear not. Here I come. Here I come. Well done, Dave. You held the fort admirably there. Let's see if this doesn't make a difference. Yes, I think we have a problem with the exposure on this thing. Uh, yeah, not ideal, is it, Darby? Okay, we're going to do a little bit of work on this. We're going to change the background. Oh, well, there we go. There we go. Oh, very nice uh, <laughs> hairs there. Those are the, that's the abdomen, everyone. Yeah, that's the abdomen. And those are the hairs of the abdomen, of course. And I just find the detail absolutely incredible. Most of those hairs will be not, of course, for thermoregulation like they are for us. Look at the abdomen there. But they'll be for some, they'll be sort of sensory organs. They'll feel different movement in the water, in the, in the air. And they'll be, they sort of, I guess, also tie together the different parts of the body. Now, you cannot see those hairs unless you have this thing under a microscope. It seems to be tying the segments of the abdomen together as well. Let's turn him over. Have a look at the top of him. There we go. <laughs> And that's what the top of him looks like. And I promise you now, you cannot, and I will show you just shortly when I've taken it out of here, you cannot see those hairs if you don't have him under the microscope. Isn't that awesome? All right, I think I've figured out what the problem is here. The problem is that as soon as, um, as, soon as he's not fully in the background, the auto exposure on this uh, microscope exposes for the underneath side. And that's what the problem is. Anyway, we'll sort that out. But what I did want you to quickly look at is that that is an antenna. Those are his two antenna. And look where they come out of. They're sort of these uh, elaborate, um, I don't know what you'd call them, sort of uh, bases from which they emerge. I think that's absolutely incredible. Anyway, that's the weevil in the microscope. Very nice. Uh, so that's what we're doing in the tent today. We're just ironing out one or two issues uh, before we go to TV, of course. We're very excited. Uh, Brenty is out there still scouring the place. He doesn't look very warm. I can see him drinking his coffee, which looks very delicious. I hope it's warm. It's in a thermos, thermostatic flask. So let's head back to Brent and get an update from him. You can see it's very cold, and I've got my flask with me to try warm my innards. But, oh, here we go. Here's a, a waterbuck bull. No, big. Oh, he's a big boy. That is a very big waterbuck. Massive horns on him. That's a prime specimen. Now, a lot of you will know, some of you won't. That that is the emblem of the Sabi Sands. Morning, morning. Now we're not going to try to go any closer to him today with this really windy weather. He'll probably be a bit nervous. Of that, I think that's Brian. That's probably one of the biggest waterbuck we've seen yeah, here in terms of horns. That is massive. Big boy. You can see very alert in this windy weather. Now we are looking at a beautiful big waterbuck, which is of course an antelope. Justin says he's researched there's 91 species of antelope worldwide. 
I'm just in light to know how many in South Africa. Justin, you're going to have to make me put my grey matter into gear early on this morning. But we've got one species for sure. It's called the waterbuck because we can see it right in front of us. But let's go through the families as we move towards the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Uh, let us start with the Cobus family since they are the first antelope we've seen. In South Africa, we have the common waterbuck. And what's closely related to them? Ah, reed buck. So we've got common water buck, uh, norm, common reed buck, mountain reed buck, fall rebok, orobi. I got those five out of the way. And those are the ones we're not going to see around here normally, apart from the water buck. We might very occasionally see a reed buck. So orobi, I'm just trying to go through the, the high fault species before we move down uh, to the low fault. Uh, black wildebeest is another one. Blessbok, Bontebok. Brian, can you think of any high fault species? Sorry? Sesame. sesame. That's a low fault species, but yes, sesame. Um, I think I've got the high fault species. Ah, springbok. And now we are on 10. And springbok. Let's try to think of any other desert species. Oh, Cape Kreisbok. One that only is endemic to the Feinbos area around the Western Cape. And then we have a sharp scrape book, which occurs around further to the east of us here. So we're at 12 now. And okay, so we're on 12. And I think we've covered the ones that don't occur in the low felt. So let's hit the low felt, let's hit the rare species first. Sable Rowan puts us to 14. And we've already mentioned Sesame. So let's go spiral horned antelope. Um, when we're on 14, Inyala, Bushbuck, 16, uh, Kudu, Eland, 18. Did I say Bushbuck? I did say Bushbuck. We're on 18. Okay. And of course, Impala, 19. Diker, 20. Blue Wildebeest, 21. And let's think, think, think. Can you think of anything else from down here? I've got a few that don't occur in, in this part of the low fold, but occur in the coastal part. So we'll do the Sunni and Red Diker, which puts us on 23 so far. Have we covered them all, Brian? I think we have. Ah! Well done, Brian. 24. I'm trying to think what else we can say. Well, definitely 24 species in South Africa. There might be one I've forgotten, but I think I have got the obscure ones like the Sunni and the Fal Ribok. Ah, Red Heart Beast. That's, uh, and Lichtenstein's Heart Beast. Oh dear. Is there on 26? Now that's not bad for 91 in the whole world and we've got 26 species just in South Africa. Now of course if we included Southern Africa, we could probably add a few more that occur. Oh no, 27, Gemsbok, desert species uh, or an oryx. I think we've got them all now. I'll keep churning to see if I've forgotten something. I hope I haven't forgotten something that lives here. That would be quite embarrassing. Okay, so we're coming up to look at the mm. Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Of course, there is ongoing construction on it at the moment, bolstering it while it's very dry. Now, in a lot of cases, the female antelope species don't have horns. And our beard said, please remind me, do lady waterback have horns? They do not. Uh, the only female that we get on, 
in the Sabi Sands that has horns is the Wildebeest. Oh, well, I'm not going to spend too much time around uh, all the work that's going on here. We're going to scoot off down to the, the bottom, but we are always checking for the lioness who's been here, and we think she's got cubs in one of these little river systems that come out of the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. So I think the, the only female that has horns is, is, is the wildebeest here. Of course, there is always, a, ah, there's always a chance we might see Sable or Eland, and both of those females have horns as well. And I think other than that, sesame female have horns, but very unlikely to see them here. But I'm gonna ponder that for a little bit longer. While I ponder, uh, James is uh, very nice and warm, and he's got something else to show you under the microscope. Now, everyone, I don't know if you've seen this before. We have shown him a few times, but I've just been sort of perfecting the view of this fellow underneath the microscope. And I know to many of you, the thought of having a basically tarantula in your hand would be utterly terrifying. But this is the South African version of a tarantula. It's a baboon spider. And we don't, we didn't really know how to die it until Steph said to me, what do you, about, what about it being stung by a wasp? Now these baboon spiders' major predators are spider hunting wasps. And what they will do is sting the spider. It paralyzes it completely, doesn't kill it. And with the sting, they lay an egg inside the abdomen here of this very beautiful spider. And then the paralyzed spider is buried in the wasp's hole and its larvae then hatch inside the abdomen and they eat it from the inside while it's still alive. That's not a good way to go. But what we have done is sort out a few things with this microscope. So let's see if we can see his eyes, her eyes. Right, and there you have the eyes staring at you. Let me just focus on them. Those are them there. Isn't that cool? So those are the eyes. The white things are the eyes reflecting the light from the microscope. And the focus is very, very sensitive. So there we go. We had it there. There. Those are the eyes. Unbelievable. Now let's go back out again. What I'm going to do is move the spider... Those are things called chelicerae, in which the venom glands for the spider are. So you can see there are two things, two kind of uh, protuberances from the front of the spider's head. You can still see the eyes in the right-hand side of, the corner of your screen. And those hairs are very sensitive. Like I said with the weevil, they are not used for any kind of um, thermoregulation or for maintaining heat. They are nerve sensors. So it helps the spider to decide where to put her fangs. Now, I'm going to flip her over. She's coming back, everyone. And I'm going to show you the fangs. There, everyone, <laughs> are the fangs of the spider. So if you're an arachnophobe and you're terrified of being bitten by a spider, well, I don't blame you. It's those very sharp things on the bottom of your screen that would stick into you and envenomate your hand and then you'll drop dead in seconds, of course. I'm talking absolute nonsense. This is a completely harmless spider to human beings, but if you happen to be something that it likes to eat, a grasshopper, for example, well, them fangs is going to make a very unpleasant day for you. Anyway, that is the baboon spider. Let's have a quick look at his abdomen. I uh, just want to have one more look at his abdomen from close up. Let me just, there we go. Oh, wow. Look at the markings. Look at those magnificent, beautiful copper gold markings. I bet if I showed you that and you were an arachnophobic person and you didn't know that this was a spider, you'd say, what an astonishingly beautiful arrangement of black, gold, and yellow colors. And then when I zoomed out a bit and put it on my hand, 
you would probably recoil in horror. Steph is not having a horrible time of, at all. He is uh, walking about. He seems to be quite well. I'm sure he's warming on his walk. Let's go and find out what he's found. Welcome back to the bushwalk part of the Sunrise Safari and you with Steph if you haven't met me just yet. And we've been on foot for the last, I don't know, probably about an hour or so now, scouring this drainage basin system that we're walking around right now. And you'll notice it's quite thick bush and that's because there's a bit more water where we are now than there would be at any other time of the year because we're getting close to this drainage lines, you know, this depression where water collects. Now, one of the reasons why I come out to places like this is purely because there's just more bushes and there's more life and there's more food and there's just more of everything. But it also makes it a bit more dangerous and a bit more, uh, you've got to take your time to walk through here really. Now, generally when you're walking in thick bush like this, you aim for patches in the bush like you can see here where you've got open patch and you've got some thick bush on either side. But it's always a good idea, always a good idea when you're walking through the bush, to walk and stop and listen. So we're going to do exactly that. You're going to come with me and you'll be, you're going to see how we walk through the bush. You walk quite slowly, keeping your eyes and ears open. As you start to get through these patches of bush, you can stop. And now what I'm looking for is on this side here, there's a thicket of trees there obviously makes a good place for animals to lie up and escape the heat of the day or look for food. And on this side, we've got a sheltered alcove. Once again, makes a good sleeping place. You can imagine a lion or a buffalo sleeping over there. There's obviously nothing there this time, but, and most of the times there's nothing there really, but that's how we walk through the bush. Stop, walk, in my mind, I'm busy looking and seeing where is it that we can possibly get ourselves into trouble. And just by respecting that simple rule, just by not really wanting to, not, not really wanting to um, change the way that the bush is done, um, we get to go through here quite safely. I say quite safely, you need a lot of skill to get through here and do things, uh, do things right, but We've been doing this for quite some time now and it's not too bad. Now Justin has just asked me, how do you make a campfire out here? Justin, the easiest would be is to use obviously one of our, one of our preferred matches or lighter with some, with some grass and then some kindling. We've actually got all the makings of a fire here right where we are now. Uh, let's see if I can get one going for us. All right, so. What you want is you want some grass, preferably as dry as possible. Now the key to a good fire is literally in the preparation. Just making a clean patch there. I don't want any errant coals busy giving us a problem. So what you want is you want to lay out your grass first. That is going to be the driest pieces that, that, uh, that you use. The next is to collect kindling. Now kindling is sticks of a variety of different sizes. All right? You don't want sticks that are too thick. You don't want sticks that are too thin. You want sticks that are just right. Right, so we've got a few sticks. Alright, let's take this over to my grass pile. And now you need a fire starter. Now fire starters can be anything from bits and pieces of dried cotton wool to birds nests of very good fire starters. You get wild cotton out here, it's also another very good fire starter. Elephant dung is quite a good fire starter. This is an old piece of elephant dung and as you can see just really just dried grass. And what we're looking for is a piece that is mostly grass and not just termite sand. This one's going to do quite well. And maybe this one. No. 
Alrighty, let's take this back to our campsite prep. And now you need something to make flame with. Now, obviously, the Bushmen have been using twirly sticks. They basically take a stick like this and they will drill a hole in it with their hands coming down, drilling, 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 drilling and drilling, drilling more. And it makes friction, a friction fire. But believe me, my hands are way too soft to make friction fires. You need palms like tar roads to get friction fires going. And I've never managed to correctly do it. What I quite like to do is use a magnesium fire stick. So I use a magnesium fire stick. To generate a spark, obviously because I want to show you today it's not going to work. <laughs> uh, hang on. There we go. Now fire is all about patience everybody. It's going to be a bit of patience with me today, <laughs> getting this going. All right, when all else fails, okay, so that's failed. I have another trick that I have up my sleeve, my little box of tricks here. And for the moment, I'm going to bypass the easy way by using some matches and go to something a little bit more, how do I say, alternative. These little cotton wool balls come packed very waterproof. And very compact. And make for the most fantastic fire starters that you can imagine. You just got to try and loosen them a bit. Get yourself out some fluff. And then strike a spark. Use your grass. And once your grass is burning, use your sticks. You want as many sticks to catch a light as you possibly can with the grass because if your sticks don't catch and your grass finishes your fire dies and you've got to start all over again basically Voila! We have fire! <laughs> and that is fire 101. Now we're going to have to put out this whole mess and pick up everything. And while we're doing that, you're going to go through to Brent for an update. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> I think that's possibly the most interesting fire making technique I've heard in a while. But it worked and there is a fire. Now we've continued to check through all of the sort of eastern central parts of Juma. We've had no luck. I'm going to now head basically west uh, towards the northwestern corner. I'm hoping we do find some lion tracks because there's no lion tracks coming this way. So I'm hoping that those two lioness have possibly moved back towards the west and hopefully not north. But fortunately you can see there's some beautiful light coming through. Uh, the clouds are breaking up and uh, hopefully we're in for a cracker of a day.
Now, this is interesting. Now, there's tracks of a big herd of buffalo here, but on top of them is what we've been looking for. All right, jump out so I can show you. I'm also gonna try and work out what's going on here. So I've got tracks going in multiple directions. So here we go. You got it here, Brian? There's a male lion track here going that way. And then he seems to turn around. I saw, where's the other one? So his track's going both ways. That looks like a lioness coming this way. Hopefully the bushes don't growl at me. I'm just gonna have a quick look down here. I wanna see if they go up into this little river system. We are live, we are live. And uh, my voice is echoing, hang on a second. Sorry, we're just trying to fix vehicles and things at the moment. Uh, well, uh, what can I show you? Brent went offline, uh, Steph went offline. He's uh, lighting a fire, it would seem. I don't have a fire over here at all. Uh, but what I can show you, there are many things I can show you, because there are many things in the wilderness, and most of them are relatively entertaining. Let's have a look at a couple of scorpions here. Ooh, the sun is slowly starting to come up, but there's a beastly wind blowing from the southeast, and that's why Steph is busy making himself a fire. Now, this is a, a pistithalmus, and the pistithalmus is also known as a burrowing scorpion. And the burrowing scorpion, although terrifying in a, a sort of appearance, is not particularly terrifying at all. And that's mainly because he has a very, well, he has got a fat tail, but he's also got very fat pincers, which means that he's not going to give you much more than a bee sting type thing. Now, what we haven't done is try to look at one of these things through the microscope. And I'm going to do an experiment here, if you'll bear with me. If you'll bear with me for one second, you can watch me uh, attempting something new, which may or may not be entertaining to you. Ah, very nice. There we have some orange. Now, what we have there are the pincers. Look at that, everybody. That's the end of the pincers. Now, Steph often speaks of what we call the trichobothria. And the trichobothria are very difficult to see unless you are looking at them through a microscope like this. They are the hairs that you can see on the end of the pincer. And much like with many, I think, of the animals that we have around here, or the insects and the arachnids, those trichobothria are extremely sensitive. And what they allow the scorpion to do, remember it's got eyes on the top of its head, it can't really see a great deal of what it's doing. But those tremendously sensitive hairs there allow the scorpion to feel where it's going to clamp those pincers. So is it if it's going to use its pincers for defense or catch some prey, the very sensitive trichobothria or nerve hairs there are able to help the scorpion to direct its, its attentions, which I think is fantastic. You know what? I'm talking nonsense. That is absolutely terrifying. Do you know what that is, everyone? I thought those were the pincers. They're not. Those are the mouth parts. Good grief, look at that. Imagine being caught by the mouth parts of the scorpion. How utterly terrifying. Ha! That's amazing. I can see the pincer now. Hang on, I'll find it for you. That's, there's one of the pincers. That's the pincer there. <laughs> How's that? Gee whiz. So the pincer much larger. So you obviously have got no idea of scale here. It's impossible to tell the scale from this. But that pincer is basically, oh, I don't know, about a fifth of an inch. Hmm. Well, I think I quite like this. Let's just have one more look at this. Let's see if we can get a look at the tail of one of them. This is a slightly different one called Pisticanthus, and I think this one's a bark scorpion. And let's have a look at the tail here. There, that's the venom sac that you can see. That's the venom sac. And behind that is the nasty little pincing tail. 
Let's see. There's the sting. Nasty stinger. Oh, I'm losing the focus. Sorry about that. Okay, let's go back to Brent Leo Smith. He seems to be standing very well camouflaged, I must say, in the middle of some green bushes. Now, there's lion tracks all over. It looks like they've been chasing these buffalo. The male has gone down into this thicket of the river system. The female's carried on along the road. It looks like there's possibly two females, possibly the ones that were around late last night that we could hear. So hopefully, fingers crossed, these tracks look really nice and fresh, especially because it's been such a windy morning. The edges are still nice and sharp. So hopefully we're gonna find some lines. Find my ears first. Now, when you see buffalo dung like that, you can see that buffalo has been moving at high speed and <laughs> depositing as it moves. So generally, probably not a very happy buffalo when it's depositing dung like that. It could also explain why we found that big buffalo bull sleeping in an area where you normally wouldn't. And they maybe had a really tough night last night. Now, if you are new and you've just found us by chance, we are on a live African safari and we're tracking lions at the moment. There's tracks of a male and at least two females. Now, there is always a possibility they might have had some success last night. Cold, windy, dark, ideal hunting conditions for lions. See these buffalo tracks running in all directions. Just want to double check that the lion's still here. Yes, she is. Let's see where she goes here. Is she going to go that way? She is. She's carried on up this little arm of the road. Come on, make it easy for us. Catch a buffalo on the road, preferably. So when you see my head off the vehicle like this, it means I'm looking for tracks. Now, I didn't see where she went there. She hasn't come out into the road yet. I'm going to check a little bit further forward, see if she does pop out. Otherwise, I'm going to go back. She might have changed direction. Check to that dead tree over there. Doesn't look like she's come up here, unless she's disappeared down into the river system. Let's go back to the last track. It's always good to just listen. Now, if an impala, or an inyala, or another antelope spots a lion, they're going to do an alarm call. The impala have a snort, it's sort of a <laughs> But they sometimes lie. They get confused, there's wind, they smell something, and they, they start snorting. Now, what we really want to hear is either monkeys or kudu. They don't lie. When they start alarm calling, they've definitely seen something. And quite often when people first come into the bush and they hear a, any of the spiral horned antelope alarm call, it's, they get confused and think there might be a dog running around because it's a very deep bark, it's sort of a and it sounds like a big dog barking, and that's their alarm call. Okay, so the last track we saw was just over here. Now, did she decide to carry on across? Okay. 
going to jump out of the vehicle quickly for two seconds. It's always easier to see the tracks when you're not driving. So the last track I saw was just over here. Okay, here we go. There's the track. Make sure there's not one under the bush. Now, did she change direction slightly and head off? Now, there she is there. Now, you'll notice I use my back foot to mark. That's a sort of an old trick, especially if you're working in a team with someone else tracking an animal. You just sort of mark the last track. It also helps you if you lose the tracks to come back and you know exactly where you've got your last track. My last track is here. Now there's a bit of confusion with all the buffalo tracks around. You've just got to go very carefully. Has she gone that way or has she gone that way? Mm. It's amazing, an animal the size of a lion treads so lightly on the ground that it can make finding tracks quite difficult. There's buffalo running here. There's definitely been some attempts on these buffalo over the night. The buffalo are running that way, and I can't see any tracks on top. Ooh, this is a bit of a puzzle to work out now, but quite often it's much better to try to think like a lion. And if I was a lioness and I was chasing buffalo in this area, where would I go and what would I do? I think I'd go that way. So that's what we're going to do. If we have no luck on further tracks up there, then we come back to the last tracks and try to figure out the puzzle and start again. And it is one of the more exciting things to do in the African bush, to test your, your wits against the animals. And quite often thinking like the animal is a lot better than following the tracks from track to track. It can take a lot longer to find the animal. But while we try to decipher what's going on around here, I'm the warm and toasty James Henry has some more interesting little critters to show you under the microscope. In Leo Smith's world, warm and toasty constitutes sitting in a very nasty draft. I promise you, as cold as he is out here, we're not really, but just tell him we are. Now, I have something amazing to show you. You've all seen geckos in your home. You've all seen them hanging about on your walls. Well, I'm going to tell you how they do it. <laughs> that, everybody, is the surface of a gecko's toe. Now, although we're getting an incredible resolution here on the gecko's toes, and those sort of ridges on the gecko's toe definitely help it to cling to whatever surface it happens to be climbing on, they struggle to sit on glass, which is a bit smooth, but walls and that sort of thing you know that they're able to cling onto. But inside those folds of skin, are special hairs called setae, and those setae are five microns in diameter each. Now, a micron is one thousandth of a millimeter, and of course, the imperial system, which belongs somewhere in the 14th century, uh, can't go down to a scale that small. So, I can only describe it to you in millimeters and microns. Microns, a thousandth of a millimeter. That means we're at the nano scale, and it means that. When, sorry, let me just move this, there we go. When a gecko is hanging onto a wall or something like that, what happens is that those little hairs, there, you can just maybe make out a little bit of those black, those, I think those black sort of gatherings there on the foot are probably those setae. But they will stick into any kind of uh, sort of seemingly smooth surface those little hairs will go into and allow the gecko to stick to a vertical and often sort of upside down kind of a surface. Now, that's interesting, I think, because when you think of a wall, you think of it as being pretty smooth, and you know 90% of the time it really isn't. And uh, one of the examples of this is if you take a snooker ball, for example, you know what a snooker ball is, snooker ball or pool ball, apparently if you look at that closely enough, it is actually less smooth scale-wise than is the um, than is the earth. So if you think of the earth as a, a round 
obviously it's a sphere, but even with the mountains of uh, the Himalaya, at the scale of a pool ball, um, a pool ball is much less smooth than the Earth. Now it's the same with most of the surfaces that a gecko like this will climb on. Now um, I know the bushwalk has something for you, it doesn't look to me like it's going anywhere, so if Kirsten is okay with it, we're going to try a rover shot. Right, watch this everybody. Here we go, to the rover. Mmm, we're moving. There we are. Now, normally we won't be moving. Normally what we'll do is just kind of park this where there are some animals. But we're going to drive it down towards the waterhole now and see if we can't see anything there. Connor is standing by because he... <laughs> <laughs> There's the Peter Brat on his. Oh, let's have a look at that. That's worth looking at. There's Peter Brat on the ladder. There's Connor. They are. <laughs> that's the waterhole camera. They have no idea that they're live. There we go. Now they do. Let's go back to the water. So what we don't want to do is startle animals. You can see Connor there was slightly startled, but not tremendously so. Ooh, there we go. It's got over its whatever it was stuck on. Now, what we don't want it to do is go rogue like it did last time, which meant it just kept driving. And so Connor, you'll probably find, is walking behind it gently. Some birds flying over towards the waterhole. And there is actually something drinking at the waterhole, looks like to me. Probably a hummerkorp. Rogue! Drone's gone, rogue! <laughs> Kirsty Cutaway, the drone's gone rogue. <laughs> Oops. Okay, we'll fix that problem. Let's go step on the bushwalk. Welcome back to the bushwalk. You with Steph, if you've just joined us, and we're walking around here, basically. Just the two of us are walking around over here in the middle of the Kruger National Park wherever you've seen Jamie and Brent driving around. It's pretty awesome. What I like to do best is look underneath barks and twigs for creepy crawlies and scary things like that. But this stump is a little bit too big for me to pick up. It's this massive piece of combretum. Uh, much too heavy. But we've had a little helper. Something is dug underneath this particular stump and has excavated a bunch of things. We now know that underneath the stump is a bunch of snails. And there's a bunch of other things as well, but most interesting was this little ball that came out. This is a dung ball. And you can see... Right, well, welcome back to the tent, everybody. It seems like a, well, very popular place to be today. <laughs> Now, I want to show you another reptile foot uh, with me microscope. Uh, look at this. This is a crocodile. Obviously not a very big one. And Dave, of course, rather macabrely, finds it most entertaining that there are things floating in the background. This is a baby crocodile that lives in a formalin solution. It doesn't live anymore. It is well dead. Uh, but it is preserved in this formaldehyde or formalin and bits of it, of course, have detached over the years. But look at the structure of its foot, completely different to that of the structure of the gecko. But you can see how it's just a modification. The gecko is a modification of the same kind of foot. And a crocodile, of course, from an evolutionary point of view, far more ancient than a gecko. And so a gecko, they would have eventually, or at some stage, have had a common ancestor. But the gecko's feet have diverged into those amazing uh, sort of adaptations that allow it to cling to vertical and, um, well, dorsal surfaces, I guess. Marvellous. Look at the little claws. I think that's fantastic to see. All righty, let's pull out from there. Well done. Uh, let's change that so you don't have to look at that. There we are. Uh, let's see what else we can find you to have a look at now that I'm really getting into the microscope. Let's have a look at this hawk moth. Now, it is a bit windy, so I don't want to really put this chap down, so I'm going to do it on my hand. But let's just have a look at the fine eyes that this hawk moth has. Oh dear, he's breaking apart, Davy. 
There we go. Look at his eyes. That that uh, grey bump there in the front of your picture there. Now, that's his eyes. Wow. Each of those is a little lens. Each of those little holes in there is a little lens. So it's a compound eye in much the same as a fly's eye is a compound eye. Isn't that unbelievable? My goodness, I've never seen it in that kind of resolution before. So that is the moth's eye. Let's go back out again and find something else on him to look at. And what I want to show you is his very fine mouth parts. Now, the mouth parts is like a proboscis. And the proboscis, of course, is used to try... And let me just quickly find focus. The proboscis is used... There we go. That's the proboscis, everyone. The proboscis is a kind of long bit on the front of the that unfolds. It's like a long tongue that unfolds from the front of the moth's face and is used to stick into flowers to get nectar. Isn't that amazing? Look at the hairs. He looks as furry as a bear. Marvellous. Okay, Steffi's back on foot. He has some signal. Let's go and find out what he has to show you. All right, welcome back to the bushwalk. We got you back after we had a slight aerial malfunction and we left you last with us trying to decide this dung ball. Inside here is it, I'm just trying to shake it out. Inside there, there you go, you can see it, is a dung beetle. So the dung beetle, its mother or father, mother and father actually, would have buried this dung ball with an egg inside it. The egg would grow into a beetle larvae eat out the inside of the dung ball and then pupate inside this home into a beetle. And there you can see the beetle there, but this one never made it that far. Something opened up this cavity, went inside of this dung ball and ate that dung beetle before it could come out. You can have a look. Have a look inside there. It looks like a purpley colored dung beetle. Awesome, hey? Dung ball that was found underneath this stump and basically was excavated by whatever was digging underneath here. Whatever dug underneath here, I'm not too sure, it looks like it was probably a bushveld gerbil of some sort. You can see all the stuff that was kicked out here. I don't think it was much bigger than that. May have found it to be a dwarf mongoose perhaps or even a slender mongoose looking for some, for some more food. But in any case, popped out this lovely little surprise which I'm going to go and give to my good friend James so that he can actually open it and identify the dung beetle for you. <laughs> While I'm sticking my face into this particular bush looking for a caterpillar of sorts, I thought that one was it. But it's not. You can see it's just a bent branch. Justin has asked, what's the best way of finding my direction in the bush if I don't have a compass? Good question there, Justin. Um, Justin, to be honest with you, we have, you, you get this feeling for where you're walking. And I'm going to say that tongue-in-cheek because I have been lost out here many, many times. But the two keys are know where you start and know the lay of your land. Luckily, although Juma is big enough for us to walk around in here for years and years and never cover every patch, we do get to know where the major drainage lines run. And at this particular reserve right now, that's how I get my direction. I know that we've got a drainage line on our left hand side right now. I also know that in this direction downstream we've got the Mulwati, another big drainage line. And I know what north of there looks like. I know what it looks like when these drainage lines start to fan out. And I use that when we're wandering around here to get direction. Other than that, when you're in an unknown place, Obviously the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. That's a good way to do it. At 12 o'clock, you can put a stick in the ground like this. If you have a watch, and at 12 o'clock, basically what you do is this stick will have a shadow. And that shadow will move. And as you approach and leave 12 o'clock, what you do is you leave bits and pieces of stick. So if you start at about 11 o'clock, you'll put a stick there, and at quarter past 11, you'll put a stick there at the shadow, and, and so on and so forth. And what you're going to see is as you approach and leave 12 o'clock, 
you're going to get an arc. And at 12 o'clock, what you do is you mark it 12 o'clock. So X marks the spot, 12 o'clock, the shadow will fall at 12 o'clock. And in the southern hemisphere, south of the tropicorn, a tropic of Capricorn, the sun is always north of us at 12 o'clock. And so this will give you south, a north-south bearing. North-south bearing, the sun rising in the east and in the west, this is exactly how you find your direction in the bush. I hope that helped for you, Justin. A well, quick lesson there, but just note, with clouds today, you can't do any shadows, which would catch me out today. But from that note, we're going to send you over to Brent. He's got an update for you. We're still hot on these lion tracks. We've got them coming in and out of a specific area. And we're going to come back to the lions because Brian has spotted something with a heartbeat. And on a cold, windy morning like this, we take heartbeats. And it, of course, is one of our favorite creatures out here. And it is the African elephant. Quite far up ahead on the road, so we should get there shortly. Yeah, now where did that elephant go? We just saw it pop across the road around here. But in this windy weather, elephants can be quite nervous. That was the fastest moving elephant in Africa. <laughs> oh, that one went quickly. Just have a quick squiz a little bit down. Maybe it moved down into the drainage. Where did that Ellie go? Oh, and speaking of Ellie's. Hi, Susie. Welcome on the vehicle. Uh, Susie's in North Carolina. Uh, Susie would like to know, on elephants' feet soft when they're born? They're surprisingly even soft when they're, when, they're, when they're an adult. Well, soft being a relative thing. But there is a thick padding even when they're born. Of course, the babies don't want to be standing on thorns immediately. But it is a, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's hard. It's more um, supple. It's very tough but supple. And elephants have a very thick pad, and then above that pad and their toes actually sit like this. And inside, it's a big uh, cartilage and a sponge, basically, like a big shock absorber to help them carry that weight. Now, where, oh, where could that elephant have gone? And I said, this windy, windy weather. Most animals don't really like it. They are a bit nervous. Now, while we continue to search the cold, James has found a way to stay warm in his tent and still go on a game drive. The rover is back. Right, there we go. Uh, now, I will keep stopping it every so often to make sure that it hasn't gone rogue. And we're just going to ask that uh, Connor takes care of it, because I am now driving towards the water, so Connor's going to have to walk around behind it. It might be quite amusing to just snap around and get a picture of him. He'll be very cross, of course. He's an engineer, you see, so he doesn't like to perform. There we are. So, like I was saying, the idea will be to get this thing into a position, I got a bit of a fright there, where where we can, where we can stop and watch things like buffalo coming down, which they will do, of course, very soon. Now, x Ranger, you say that ro this rover has a mind of its own. It does seem to, and that it needs to learn or be programmed, certainly, with some robot laws. Yes, I think, you know, as artificial intelligence goes, this is profoundly stupid. But um, 
It's certainly a wonderful, wonderful addition to our game drives. This seems to be absolutely fine. This is marvellous. Let's turn it around quickly. I bet Connor's just behind. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> anyway, there's a whole lot of technical stuff going on there at the water hole. Very important. Now, the reason there are no animals coming down here, of course, is because it's cold. And I'm going to stop the rover. It's not moving now, but you can see the clouds scudding over the sky from the southeast. That's generally where our frontal weather comes from. With any luck, a buffalo or an elephant will come to have a drink at some stage of that starling that you can see flitting about out to the right-hand side of the screen. And, uh, yes, with any luck, we'll have some magnificent animals to show you. So, we have our rover. We have our amazing microscope. Quite soon, we will have a fixed-wing drone flying about the place, which will show us all sorts of interesting things. So that's marvellous, too. I'm going to put these back and see what else we have to show you. I think maybe let's have a quick look. Oh, in fact, let's go to Steph first. And then I'm going to show you a snail shell. Welcome back to the bushwalk. And we are bringing it to you live all the way from Juma Private Game Reserve in the middle of the Kruger National Park. You're with Steph, who's on on camera, and we found you a Tambwiti thicket. Now, while that might not sound like anything too glamorous or too fantastic, and pretty much it really isn't, um, sticking to the wilderness survival theme that we've managed to come up with for today's sort of topic, these little thickets make for the best campsites ever. And the reason for it is quite simple. They offer a little bit of protection from the wind and from other elements. As you can see, it's fairly thick. You can clear yourself out a nice little clearing inside here, which we might, if we can get Jandre's massive antenna in here, we might go and stand inside here just to show it to you. Let me help you here, Jandre. All right, let's see. Lots of kindling for fire. <laughs> Here we go, you've got a little bit of bush happening over there. Let me help you. Yeah, there you three. All right, so bring you into where I would make my camp right here. I clear out all the underbrush and I would string my hammock probably from this tree here to this one here, giving me a nice bed to sleep on. I'd make myself a fire right here. And another added bonus of being inside a Tambuti thicket is that they exude a milky latex. And that milky latex keeps insects away. So these Tambuti thickets can actually help keep you sleeping at night and not plagued by thousands of biting insects that will come and plague you. So these Tambuti thickets, very good places to make campsites. And this particular thicket looks pretty good. This is a pretty good campsite. I'd be quite happy to actually make my campsite in here. I'd have to drag a thick branch into there just to give me some protection. All right, and Justin's asked a nice question here. In actual fact, Justin, I've just picked up something for you. Good that you're watching the show today. You've asked, in a survival situation, how do you get drinkable water? Now, while water might be freely available out here, dams, pans, muddy wallows, even seeps and digs where elephants have dug, it's not always clean water. And you've got to find a way of purifying water. Now, in the segment before, I taught you how to make a fire. Now let's do something with water. Now I've just, just picked this up. It is a snail shell. These are very, very common out here. This is a giant land snail's shell. Basically, you take your giant land snail's shell and once you've built your fire, you take two hardwood pieces of bush, uh, two, uh, two hardwood pieces of wood that's not going to burn as easy, and you build yourself a hot fire with little twigs, and then you place your snail shell just like that between the two twigs. Now, obviously, this water didn't come from a dam, but you can imagine if it did. 
You then fill up your snail shell with water and letting the flames heat up the bottom of the shell, you make sure that this water in here boils for at least 10 minutes. At least 10 minutes. Once the water is boiled for 10 minutes, you then either drink it when it's cool, you can drink it, or what you do is you pour it back into your water canister. And that is how you get drinkable water out here in the bush. So, bon appétit. We're going to send you over to an elephant with Brent. Well, there's a great grey bottom right next to us. We did find the elephants, not the one that disappeared across the road. We found some others. These are some big females we've got here. And the one over there, she's got really long tusks for a female. Hello, big girl. And fortunately for us, they're a very nice and relaxed herd, which in this wind is a bonus, because quite often you might come across eddies that are not going to be very relaxed in the wind. And they're hiding behind the bush is a little one. And there are probably a few more spread out through the bush that we can't actually see. Now both these females are particularly big probably well into their 40s already. Now we can actually almost see into her ear from here because we're almost directly behind her. Feeding off a buffalo thorn, one of our only evergreens that's actually got lots of nutrients and you'll notice a lot of the ellies, kudu, inyala, bushbuck, all the browsing species are going to be eating a lot of buffalo thorn this dry season. Hey, big girl. Let's move forward a little bit. Remember, always very important, let your vehicle run for a few seconds and it's even more important in the strong wind conditions. We don't want to surprise the elephants at all. And I've already put my vehicle into low range so it can idle without me having to push on the accelerator. Keeps the sound nice and calm. Don't want to disturb them. Hello, big mama. Yes, hello, big lady. And she's feeding off an acacia. Now, that particular acacia species is a red thorn. And in this part of the world, they never manage to get to big trees. The elephants really like them and keep them nice and short. Now, you can see those massive thorns on there and she will chew straight through them with absolutely no problem. The inside of an elephant's mouth is probably akin to a very old leather boot. Very, very tough. Lovely, lovely, even tusks she has. A left hand tusk is her working tusk. It's a little bit shorter and you can see the points just not as sharp. As always, some of our viewers are very perceptive. And Shamsun is wondering, is she a nursing female based on the size of her breasts? Now she is, and what's really important we can tell there is if you have a look, there's a little wet mark around her, her nipple. So she has been nursing probably within the last 45 minutes or so. 
And judging from where that little one was hanging about, I would say that little elephant is probably belongs to her. Really nice relaxed herd. Very, very excited to find a relaxed herd in this wind. Uh, quite often they do what that other elephant we saw briefly earlier does, and they run off into the bush. I can hear more of them down there, down towards the little river system. So we're right on the peripheries of the herd. Isn't she just gorgeous? There we go, look at her using that working tusk to break that little red thorn. And she's going to drop that left tusk. There we go, look at that. Using it to just break that branch, make it a little bit easier for her to remove with her trunk. She might pop the tusk under there again if she's not going to succeed. See how she's working it round and round and round to get it to break. There we go, tusk in and success. And at this time of the year, especially when it's windy, you'll often see that little white spot around her eye. And that's a buildup of dust. And those long eyelashes help keep the dust out of her eyes. So it's built up just on the corner of her eye. And sometimes you actually see them clean that dust with their trunks when it builds up a lot. You can see the little baby in the background. Looks like probably one and a half to two years old, judging from size. And that poor red thorn has disappeared now. She's eaten the whole, the whole tree almost. the little one up to. Also feeding away, so not yet weaned. Now, elephants of course have a very distinct smell that's often left by their droppings. It's actually not an unpleasant smell, it's quite sweet and bear in Canada is wondering can you smell elephant before you see them? Often you can, you also hear them uh, quite often before you see them, but in a, on a day like this with this gusting wind, it's very difficult. You might get whiffs of that smell, but it'll be very difficult to determine where it's coming from. Let's try and move a little bit forward and see if we can see any more down behind. And again, remember, let the engine run, let them get used to the sound. Make sure if you are coming to visit the Kruger and you are driving yourself around, if you're not sure, give the elephant space and remember to watch for those telltale signs, that extended tail, slight stiffness in the legs, if they lift their head and open their ears, rather than just give them a little bit more space. As you can see, she is completely fine with us. Uh, even then, I'm still going to make sure I'm not driving at her, try to drive angles away from the animals. Hey, big mama. So we're probably about eight or nine feet from her at the moment, and you can see she's completely ignoring us, carrying on with her daily devouring of, in this case, a little red thorn. As I said, they can become big trees, red thorns, but they never get the opportunity in this part of the world. Okay, now using her foot. All sorts of weapons in her arsenal to get the most out of that little plant. Oh, 
No, I'm going to eat the branch first. I can actually hear her crunching on that branch. Lovely old lady. Since we've got a baby elephant around here, Sham's son's wondering, what is the sort of gap between an elephant female having babies? And they'll normally only have another one six to eight years, depending, after they've given birth to their last one, which means in their lifetime, once they reach sexual maturity, they can normally produce five, sometimes as much as, as many as seven. Oh, yes, big girl. I'm just reminding her she's there and she's big. And that was just a head shake. There wasn't any of the other sort of danger signs with the tail and the legs. And now she looks like she's moving on to this next little red thorn here. And you can see how, if we look a bit closer at this bush, how big the actual stem is and how small the bush is. And that's just because it's maintained by elephants. Well, off she goes. Well, we're not going to follow them into the thickets today especially with this wind, and she's given us such an incredible sighting already. Well, we're going to move on, see what else we can find out here. And while we do that, let's go see what James is up to in his haven. I am looking, everybody, at the very poor dental hygiene of the side-striped jackal. That is a cavity. You see that? In which many bacteria will reside. Of course, this particular black back jackal, uh, well, it's not going to worry about this anymore because it has been dead for some time. But you can just see the cavities in these teeth, and I can't imagine that can have been very comfortable at all. So perhaps a black back jackal uh, suffers from toothache, possibly also a very old black back jackal. You can see, not very good with, very, with much uh, cleaning of the teeth there. Very poor dental hygiene indeed. I'm quite tempted to do this into my own mouth and see what I can see. I'm not going to do that while we're live, though. Kirsten says that's a good idea, we don't do it live. But you can just see the decay there of the enamel. And I imagine that's just pretty normal for, you know, anything that you leave out in the wild for long enough, it will decay the teeth will be the very last things to go. Now, um, <laughs> we're going to go back to the rover, and I'm just going to show you the picture that we have now. That's what we're going to leave it as for the next little while, and we've moved Connor out of the way. Uh, that's because we're not going to try and drive it. We're going to just position it there. You can see it's at the inlet to the pan, and so we're hoping one or two animals might come down, perhaps even a bird or two. And we'll just see what happens. Like I say, it's quite cold today. And so I don't think we're going to get the normal sort of collection. Oh, look, dove, as we speak, ring-necked dove making rover debut. Oh, two ring-necked doves making rover debut. It's all happening here, everybody, at the rover. Oh, flying up and fl flying down. This is not a view of a ring-necked dove you normally get, of course. There's one skitting across the front. This is fantastic. No, don't go. Come and have more to drink. There we go. The ring neck dove, of course, most obvious by its lovely morning call. That's what they do. I'm sure they won't be the only birds popping down here. And what we want to do is not disturb them. There might be a case, of course, if a herd of elephants come back, comes down for us to reverse or change the angle slightly, uh, and we will do that. We can do that. We have our little joystick here, which has more buttons on it than the controller of an F-15, uh, but we won't be using any of those. As I mentioned, in the, no, I didn't to you, we did a fireside chat yesterday uh, for rehearsal, and um, we talked about all the new technology. Oh, this is fantastic. The hyenas are back at their den. Is 
business thrilling. The hyenas are back at the den off in Vubu Road, where we've been seeing that single hyena lying, but it looks like a bunch more have moved in. Here we go. <laughs> so we've got one adult. Oh, more, more coming out. Just hyenas everywhere. Two, three adults. Bunch of youngsters. Now, I wonder if we're going to see tiny little cubs appearing. So exciting to have the hyena den back again. I've started hearing the noises during the night and I thought, oof, we better go do some den site checking this morning. <laughs> Hello. There's a yearling, more or less. Ooh, elephants trumpeting in the background. Gorgeous light coming through. Well, that looks like the female who has been here for a few days before the rest of the troops seem to have arrived. Now what we want her to do is start going into that hole and maybe we'll get the first glimpse of the latest members of the Juma clan. Down the hole she goes. Upset elephants in the background. to the den. They might have been born already, they just haven't made the movement up to the entrance yet. They normally come out for the first time, can come out as early as 10 days old. And of course the others at the other entrance Suckling on that big female. <coughs> oh, her head's popped out again. There's dust coming out of it. Have a look, there she is. Now, just from the way that's young one's behaving. I think she probably has had the babies, yes. And she's trying to make sure that the, the terrible teens behave themselves. Fortunately, now there are little crevices inside the den that'll be too small even for the terrible teens to get to. And that's where those little cubs will hide till their mom calls them out. Now, hyenas, as well as most of the other predators, use den. Oh, what you doing? Now, Justin's wondering, are hyenas born with their eyes closed? They are, Justin. They are born very small with their eyes closed and covered in a layer of black fluffy fur. Is she trying to call them out? It's difficult to hear with all this wind. Could we be here about to witness the first emergence? Tiny hyena cubs. This is so exciting. I can't hear if she's doing that low that the mothers often do to bring out the cubs. But just the way she's putting her head into the 
into the hole and hovering there. There's the rest of the fan dam. Come on, bring those babies out. If you guys are ready, with your fingers on the screenshot buttons if those little tiny black beauties emerge from that hole. It might be a day or two before we see them though. Look at the naughty, naughty, terrible teens. Oh, down the hole again. Uh, they are such fascinating creatures. Chris is wondering, can hyenas be domesticated? Well, Chris, in theory, you can domesticate any animal, but uh, there's always a chance that its natural instincts will take over. I know of someone who had a pet hyena and lived with him for many years with no problem, used to run around with the dogs and then one day he slipped and fell funny and the hyena attacked him, it was just an instinctive response it, 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 it's natural for a hyena to take advantage of any sort of perceived weakness and as the gentleman who owned the hyena got older and fell funny that hyena saw him as a, as, as a weaker object and no longer dominant and it, it just really tore him to pieces Oh, look at that, there's some begging and squealing and jostling going on for attention to those teats. We're going to sit here and hope for a visual of those tiny, tiny cubs for the first time. While we do that, let's go have a look what feathered friend James has found in his domain. There's a magpie shrike, everybody, which is a great joy. A couple of birds have popped onto the clearings on this blustery, chilly day. That's the magpie shrike that Dave's filming now. There are two of them around, and there are a couple of virtual starlings as well, which is nice. This wind is truly unpleasant. But the birds have to eat, and so they must walk around. And I often think, how do animals cope with this sort of discomfort? And I suppose they just don't have a choice, do they? They can't go inside if they want to. I suppose they could find a nest, but generally they just have to cope with it, and that's exactly what they're doing. We're hoping for a couple more birds, of course, to come flying down to the waterhole, where they will hopefully sit in front of our rover. The rover, of course, needs a, a name sometime soon. Rogue the rover, so far. Oh, two species of birds, and just to we'll show you the sky, I'm sure Brent and, um, Brent and Steph have done that, but if you look up towards the sky there, you can see the clouds scudding overhead. Now while we do that, one of the animals that has no choice when it comes to how it feels is an ant, and Steph has got an unbelievable ant, and I'm going to nip back into the tent to hear what he says about it, with two astonishing protuberances from the front of its head. Choice at what they are in life, they castes. In other words, this little forager was born to be a forager and nothing else. And is a female in actual fact, had no choice of being a male either. Now this is my favorite ant. It's a trap jaw ant and I'm going to see if I can show it to you. The reason why I like these ants is specifically for those massive jaws that you see on them there. They are purpose-built termite hunters and are one of the very, very few termite predators that can overcome soldier termites with those huge pincers. Those jaws can set wide open and snap closed so hard on the head of a soldier termite that they'll kill that soldier termite. 
Can you believe that? One of the fastest mechanical movements in all the animal kingdom is the jaws of those ant. Now, I'm going to put him down and I want to see if we can actually get him to open up his jaws for us so that you can see what it's like when they walk around. Now let's see if he opens up his jaws. Here he is here, you can follow my finger, not a very big chappy. These ants forage on their own, they look for termite colonies and then they bring a termite back to the colony and fetch all the rest of their friends and then go out hunting for more termites. Quite often killing quite a few termites in the process. Luckily these colonies are never, never really very big and so they do negligible, negligible damage to two nesting colonies of termites. She doesn't want to open up her mouth for us. But basically she's walking around with her jaws closed. When she sets her jaws, her jaws open exactly 180 degrees and are then pre-tensioned to snap closed as soon as they feel something inside of them. And she will snap it closed on a termite in an instant. She's not opening up her jaws, of course, just because I want her to, she's absolutely now not doing it. There, she looks like she's going to, no, no. There we go, she's opened up her jaws, or is wanting, there we go, she's opened up her jaws. We've actually got one of her friends here with the jaws open. Here we go. When it comes up into view, you should be able to see her coming up into view now. This incidentally is one of James's favorite ants as well. Let's see, come now. You'll see this ant has her jaws set, fully open. There you go. You can see her jaws are fully open and set to snap shut at the smallest trigger. Let's see if we can get her to do that. Boom, did you see that strike? How fast was that? Boom, and again. Don't want her to bite me, they bite quite sore to be quite honest. There she's running around, I've disturbed her. But how quick was that strike, hey? Amazingly fast. <laughs> Good stuff. Now that my trap jaw ant is finished, we're going to send you back to hyenas who have a much stronger jaw than these little guys. The man's email sort of just goes... Oh, pardon, sorry about that, it seems like I'm having a comms issue. But we're still with the hyena den. And you can see, you can hear there that one just to the left of that female is begging, Mom, I'm still hungry, and oh, being chastised. You can hear that begging. Can we hear it, Brian? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. So the one, those two obviously belong to that female. Now, that's going to be a male and a female cub. Hyenas have quite a savage start to their life as tiny little black babies. They practice Cain and Abel syndrome or sibilicide. Quick, quickly on this one, Brian, she's licking something. It could be the fur, we can't see it, but there could be a tiny baby there she was licking. I could see that she was licking. And we might try and move a bit further away. We might be able to get a view into that, into that hole where she is. But you can see she's licking something there. And just from her behavior, look, there it is. There it is, did you see that? Blue eyes still. Isn't that amazing? The first tiny glimpse of a baby hyena. Oh, and now the terrible teen is going to come ruin it for us because she's not going to let them out with that monster there. Oh, 
wasn't that amazing. We just said her behavior looked like she'd just given birth. That little hyena is tiny. Hello, Mom. Well done. Now, probably that sort of yearling or terrible teen that's there is higher ranking socially than her. So she's not able to sort of seriously chase it off, but she can try block it from getting to the babies. Now, the really interesting thing is if we come out a little bit there, Brian, you can see that that yearling's tail is starting to get extended, so it is getting excited. Hopefully it moves away, and those little ones might come back up to the entrance. Now it's not uncommon to watch a female do this and block the hole from other hyenas, especially if she's a low-ranking female. Now hyenas have one of the most fascinating social structures. They're the only truly matriarchal society out here in the bush. And the females inherit their hierarchy from their mother. And even the highest ranked male is still lower ranking than the lowest female. So you don't really want to be a male <coughs> in hyena society. They are physically smaller, bullied, beaten. But now with females, now more than likely that this yearling that's popping its head into the den where we got that very brief, brief glimpse of one of the latest members is of, from a higher ranking female than the one who's just given birth. Yes, fortunately, it's moving or moved away. Now, hopefully, those little ones will come out again. I'm just going to move a little bit further back so we can see a bit further into the hole. Just gonna move very slowly. And isn't this exciting? We're gonna get to watch the next bunch of Juma babies. Oh there we go. If we stay a little oh something's up. Those females have smelt something or heard something. You can see there's a lot more alertness from the one that was suckling a little bit earlier. Could it be those lion tracks we've been following in this area all morning? I'm pretty sure they went to the north. But they could always move on a cool morning like this. Now that ties in perfectly with what Sticks are asking. What happens if another predator finds this den? Well, the babies will disappear underground, even the yearlings and the, the terrible teens. Well, the adults, depending on how many and what the different predator is, if it's a leopard uh, or a single lioness, you'll probably find the females will chase it off at high speed. And if it's a male lion, they'll skedaddle as well with leaving the baby safely underground. Now, where are you looking? My other female's looking back behind, just in front of us towards the little river system that we're on the edge of. Now there are elephants all around us. It could be elephants. Elephants will chase the hyenas if they come close. Fortunately for the hyenas, they're a bit quicker and far more nimble. Oh, there we go. That female's still trying to protect the newborns from from that, from that other yearling, but you can see she's showing submissive signs to those to those younger younger hyenas. So definitely, those younger hyenas are born to a higher-ranking female. And you can see she's she's sort of whining, but not baring her teeth. 
Because if she bares her teeth and gets aggressive with that youngster, that youngster will get aggressive back and any high-ranking individual around will attack that female who's blocking the den at the moment. So she's trying sort of to, to keep that youngster out but without being too aggressive, so going the submissive route. And that's why it's so fascinating to spend time with hyenas. The intricacies of their, their social behavior is something that I think we truly don't have completely under grasp yet. You can hear the branches breaking not too far away, so there are elephants here. I'm just going to move a little bit further back, so in case that baby comes out, that st stick is not in the way, or that tree. How's that, Brian? I think there. So that yearling has moved away. Now let's hope that that tiny little one makes another appearance. So we don't know how many there are. We know there's one for sure. We just had that such a small glimpse of those tiny hyena still had blue eyes a couple of days old but yeah well she rests there if that yearling doesn't come back we've got a good oh no it's coming back <laughs> Tanner, hi Tanner, welcome on the drive with us. Tanner's from Oklahoma, and Tanner would like to know where all the males are. Well, Tanner, quite often the males will sleep away from the den, because if they spend too much time at the den, they tend to get harassed by the cubs that are, well, if they're a female, they're all higher ranking than them, but they'll be around. They do come to the den from time to time, but normally around the den you're going to see the females, sub-adults and cubs. Now, it's not uncommon to see a hyena cub of as young as three or four months out foraging with a female. Now, very interestingly, this means that that cub is from a very low-ranking female. So high-ranking females cubs get the best choice of everything and they'll stay at the den. The female will actually bring food back. If a low-ranking female was to bring food back, it would be stolen by the higher-ranking female. So a low-ranking female will actually take her cub out with her foraging to try and ensure it gets enough food. So if you ever see a young hyena cub with an adult far from the den, you know that it's because she's low-ranking. Hyenas. Oh, Brian, there's licking going on again. So I can just see the way she's moving. She's licking. Come on, pop your head up. Pop your head up. Come on, little one. Is everyone ready with their screenshots? I hope someone managed to get a screenshot of that little thing. It was a split second, but I know some of you guys are so fast with those screenshots. If you did get a screenshot of that little hyena, we would love to see it. You can share it on Twitter with the hashtag Safari Live, or you can pop it on our Facebook page, Safari Live. Now those little ones might be suckling. There we go, I've heard some have got some great screenshots of that tiny little hyena. That is really exciting. And we get to watch another generation of Juma's hyenas grow up. The wind is very strong today, so that's another reason she might be a little bit more cautious with letting that youngster come out too much because with the swirling wind, they might be approached by a, something like a lion, 
and, and not know about it. And those little guys don't quite have their coordination to scamper just down the hole yet. They're that young. So we're definitely going to wait. Maybe we'll get another tiny glimpse of that little bundle of joy. We know there's one for sure. And we're hoping that there's two. And while we wait at the hyena den, hopefully to try catch another glimpse of that tiny, tiny, tiny little hyena. Let's go have a look at something tiny under the microscope with James. Well, it's not... Stand by one second. I've... Uh, there, 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 there. There we go. I set up a very clever way of holding the speaker that I listened to underneath the desk. It's now fallen on the floor and shattered into 35 pieces. Never mind. Now, what we're trying to do is uh, have a look at a bat. Now, this bat uh, is also having a bit of a swim in some formal formaldehyde. And I just wanted to try and get a look at its little teeth, but I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. I can't actually get, get a look at them. Let's just f try and focus. There we are. There they are. There are the little teeth of the bat with bits of its body floating past, which uh, Dave finds quite entertaining. It's a bit macabre. Yeah, you can't really see great definition there on the teeth. But you can see the nostril, as Kirsten says. There's a nostril. Not a very nice nostril. Anyway, we're just going to try various things with this microscope. The other thing, let's have a look at, sorry, it's going to be a little bit awkward if I move it too much while you're live, is let's just have a look at some at the wing. Oh, that's quite nice. We can have a look at the at the membrane of the wing. So the wing you always think of, of course, or I certainly do, as being completely smooth. And you can see there that it is anything but completely smooth. Look at that. That's the membrane of the wing, everyone. So, I mean, we think of them being completely smooth, leathery, and they're actually quite, well, not smooth at all. They've got all those folds in them. I think that's quite interesting. Then, let's have a look. Kirst, if you'll just come out again. That's it, otherwise you'll get seasick as I move. What we're going to look at here is the claw. Now, I don't suppose many of you know that a bat has a claw. But there's the claw coming out of... Oh, look at that. Gee whiz, look at that. Now that claw comes out the top of the wing and it's almost impossible for you to tell that that, I mean, it, it, the wing is basically a hand. So where a bird's wing is largely the arm, everything that holds together in a bat's wing is actually a hand. So all of those... Uh, if you can think of an open bat's wing, those bones, those very fine bones of the phalanges, which are basically the finger bones of your hand, and one of them ends or terminates in this claw, and it's probably the thumb, or the equivalent of the thumb digit, that is terminated in this claw halfway down the wing. And, Curse, if you just go out from there again, uh, here's the bat, and there you can see halfway down the wing is that claw. And that claw is used for hanging on to things. So that it, when it hangs, uh, I know this is not an ideal picture, but you can just get an idea of where, where the claw sits on this bat, who looks quite miserable in here, doesn't he? Well, going to be miserable for a long time because he ain't going to be released from here. Right, that is the yellow house bat. Now... Uh, let's head across to the waterhole where the rover is sitting. Uh, we can see there is not a great deal going on there. That is purely a function of the fact that it is so very cold at the moment. And, oh, there's a butterfly flying past. Fantastic. Now, I'm just going to show you that it is still mobile. We'll just do a little flick around turn. There we go. And there you can see the Juma Dam. And you can see those clouds moving at quite a speed and the trees swaying in this 
rather nasty, gusty wind. Let's do a full 360 degree turnaround. Now it does make a little bit of a noise, it gets And we don't want it to do that too much. Oh, I see we've got closer to the water by mistake. It would have been very, very upsetting had we planted it in the water again. Right, there we are. It's so exciting that the hyena is back at the den. All of the hyenas seem to be back there. That little one made a very brief appearance. Unfortunately, Brentley o. Smith got extremely excited. And, uh, you know, he doesn't have a quiet voice, and I think it probably thought, good grief, I don't know when to be out here. It'll come out again, I've no doubt, very soon. Let's head back across to Brent and the hyenas. So we're still sitting next to the hyena den. She is showing signs. There we go. When she looks down like that, that might be suckling. Oh, is there some movement? There's some licking. So there could be a little one right there. But definitely worth playing the patience game here at the Mvubu Road Hyena Den. I think out of all the dens, this is my favorite one. It's the most picturesque, it's the biggest. It's got wonderful timburtis all over it. There we go. Come on, little one. Now, of course, that female's been quite protective of that entrance where the cubs are. Kathy's wondering, will a high-ranking sub-adult kill a low-ranking cub? Well, Kathy, probably not on purpose. They probably just want to play with it, and they can be a little bit rough, and, and that can result in, in an injury to that cub. I think it's more, more just a bit of rough housing that when they're very young, they can't really handle. Come on, come out, come out. Oh, snoozing again. <laughs> got that one tiny glimpse of a baby and Lily is in sunny California would like to know if I can show you the size with my hand well I would guess it's probably about that long actually it's probably about the length of a baby hyena uh, my, my flask and in terms of height it's probably not much taller than that it's probably about that high off the ground I'd say it's probably even a little bit shorter than the flask. Uh, they, probably, they weigh very, very little uh, when they're first born. Um, if I remember correctly, it's around 200 or 300 grams. And they've got definitely one of the more complex, complex social structures of all animals out in the bush. Yeah, there's elephants all around. They might come join us. Now, we can't really see inside the den. We really see just what's going on on the edges. And Tanner, who's an Oklahoma would like to know what it looks like inside that hyena den. Well, when I was younger, Tanner, I used to do some slightly strange things, and I, I have crawled inside a hyena den with a headlamp once before. Uh, obviously, of course, once they had moved out, I did manage to get bitten by many, many fleas, and that's one of the reasons that hyenas move between different dens, is because of flea infestations. But I wanted to see what was going on in there. Now, the one thing you've got to be very careful about is that hyenas often will share dens with porcupines. 
and they'll have their own little entrances and exits that they use. So you've got to be careful. You don't really want to meet a porcupine face to face underground, but basically there's, there's a lot of tunnels and some of them are quite big and there's nice big rounded oval chambers. And then even off those chambers, there's smaller little chambers. And uh, it's basically a little honeycomb under there of, of tunnels and, and chambers. I don't climb into hyena dens anymore. Uh, a bit too old for that now. And being at my height, climbing around the hyena den is not the easiest thing. We've talked about how complex the social structure of hyenas is. And Marion's wondering, do females ever challenge each other for that dominant position? Marion, it's, it's, it's one of those sort of slightly gray areas when it comes to hyenas. It's a yes and no. Generally, it's, it's, as you say, it's a, it's a hierarchy that's inherited from, from mother to daughter. But of course, a a dominant female hyena can have multiple daughters during her life and, and you can definitely see some competition between them and it maybe uh, it, it does heat up a little bit sort of when the matriarchal female is getting a bit under the weather so to speak towards the end of her li life but uh, it's one of those things I, I definitely can't say I'd, yes 100 percent but there, I mean, there is definitely some competition between the daughters of the dominant hyenas Oh, we've got some movement at the baby's entrance. Oh, lovely bit of light coming through. Come on, one more little visit, please. Our clan, I would guess, is probably around 20, maybe a few more than that strong. And not the biggest clan in the northern Sabi Sands is a clan to the west of us that's about 50 strong. And the biggest clan I've ever seen was in northern Botswana, and there were over 100 individuals in that clan, and they often used to actively hunt buffalo, hippo, all by themselves. And they actually pushed the lions, a lot of the lions out of that area. The lions became... The, the second dominant predator just because of the sheer number of hyenas that were around. Oh, hyenas in captivity can live for about 20 years. In the wild, it's normally between 10 and 15 years. Oh, she's coming out. She's going to pop her head down and call the babies. She uses that low call. It sounds a bit like... <laughs> We're a bit too far away to hear it from here with this gusting wind. might have been sending them down. Or they've gone into a part of the chamber she can't get to from this side, so she's going to go in from the other side. So a lot of those tunnels are interconnected. And she might be going to spend some time with them deep, deep in the termite mound. I don't think she's going to come out again with those little guys. I think she's going to spend some time with them under the ground. So we're going to take a meander, see what else we can find. And while we do that, James is again playing with his microscope. <laughs> yes, I am playing with my microscope, everybody. What we have for you is a view of the underside of a termite. There it is. 
And there you can see the six legs. Now, I don't know if you know this or not. Some people do, some people don't. But uh, an insect, of course, is made of three segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. And the six legs of an insect, which you can see there, come straight out of its thorax. They all come from a very similar spot, I think, on the mid-joint of the thorax. Look at that. That's a close-up, sorry, excuse me. It's still in its jar, so it doesn't blow away. It's a little bit difficult to focus on. But look at the amazing definition there of the legs. And the bits at the end there, you can see on the, the left-hand side. Sorry, there we go. There we go. Look at the left-hand side leg that you can see. And you can see the two claws on the front there. And then the segments of the leg leading up to the big femur at the back. Now, remember that there is no bone inside that leg. So your leg has got a femur bone inside it. It's surrounded by soft flesh. This one is all soft inside and is maintained largely by the exoskeleton outside and a certain amount of hydraulic power. So there's a lot of or hydraulic pressure. There's a lot of hydraulic pressure inside the exoskeleton which in turn gives the leg its stiffness and allows it to move around at the speeds that it does. That is an incredible, incredible picture to me. Wow. Look at the claws there. Justin, this is a very easy question for me to answer. You want to know which arachnid or bug makes me the most uh, freak it, freaked out. Uh, Justin, that is very easy to answer. It's something called a centipede, which I think many people are freaked out by. I know even Brent Leo Smith is tremendously freaked out by a centipede. And a centipede, um, well, if I, it's a bit windy, but if I had my drawing, I would draw it for you. They've got basically segments. You've all seen a centipede, probably. I'm just trying to think if I have a picture of one here. Um, I do, actually. Stand by it. There is a picture of one here somewhere. No, it's outside. I will <laughs> retrieve a picture of a centipede at some stage. But basically, they have segments, and each segment has a, a pair of legs on it, and then they've got two nasty little stingers that come out the back, and then they bite as well. And they're ri really nasty, and they can, make in they can give you an incredibly painful bite. And so they're just very creepy. They freak me out completely. Back at the rover, uh, there is nothing going on at all. Let's have a quick look there. There it is. Not much going on at the rover. I think that's purely a function of the fact that it is uh, so chilly. You can see some waves in the far right-hand side of the thing there. Yes, so we can go and have a quick look there. Oh, Siberia, nice question from you. You say, can we get some pond water and look at it under the microscope? Yeah, I think we should definitely do that. I'm just going to move slightly forward here. And stop there. Ooh, I got a bit of a fright. I just thought it wasn't going to stop, in which case I'd have been in big trouble. But there you can see the wind blowing the surface of the water. I was hoping that might actually be a terrapin that was making those waves, but it's just the wind. Alas and alack. Anyway, there we are. Um, right, shall we have a look at something else under the microscope? Uh, what shall we see? Oh, James Richard, you wanted to look at the vulture's feather underneath the microscope, so let's look at that. Now, here is the vulture's feather. It's very large, same size as my forearm. That's quite impressive. Not that I have a very enormous forearm, but it's not that much smaller than anyone else's. So let's put the microscope here onto the barbs, barbules, and the barbicels of this amazing feather. There we are. That's not a great picture. Hang on, Curse, come back out again while I try and redo it. It's just difficult to know which background is going to work best, everyone. So let's go here onto the white background and see if that doesn't work better. We're just going to split apart the filaments of the feather. Move out the way of Dave. All my little artifacts and things. Okay. There we go. 
So there you can see the barbs, barbicels, and the barbules. So the barbs are the long bits that you can see. The barbules are those feathery bits you can see on the left, on the right hand side of the left hand barb, if you know what I mean. I can't point at it because it's too small, the scale is too small. And then each of those little sort of feathery hairs will also have a little hook on it. And that little hook uh, will help these barbs stick together like Velcro. Now just come out one second again, Kirst, and let me go back again and see if I can't. We might be able to get a look at the barbs, and I'm going to try and measure them for you. Okay, back in again. There we are. There you go. There's a bit of a measurement idea for you. Yeah, that's about as close in as we're going to get. But each of those, each of those things is, a, is, is what is that? It's probably a millimetre or tenth, mm, yeah, about a millimetre. Isn't that amazing? So it's like Velcro. You can see that that's Velcro sticking together the different barbs. So when I say barb, I mean one of these. So one individual here is a barb. And they're held together by those barbules, which are the hairy bits you saw there. And each of those is got a whole lot of hooks on it called barbicels. And there we are. And maintained, of course, by a bird's fastidious preening. So they hook these things together. They put oil on them on a daily basis. And like I explained the other day, there's no blood supply or nerve supply in a feather like this once it's grown. And so it has to be maintained mechanically. It cannot be maintained um, in the same way that, say, your hair follicles are maintained or that your skin is maintained. Brentlier Smith is now driving around. Uh, I think he's doing a remarkably good job of staying stoic in the cold. So let's go and get an update on where he's going. James seems to like to remind me that Brian and I are sitting out in the cold and he's cosy in the tent. I mean, he, he's going on game drive with the joystick now. Isn't that incredible? He's just rude. He's just rude. There you know, Brian says he's just rude. Well, we freeze ourselves away here. But of course, definitely worth it. First glimpse of that tiny hyena. So exciting to have the hyenas back on property. Oh, and I'm still convinced that there's a leopard somewhere in this area that had those hyenas running around at the first start of the sunrise safari. So I just want to do another last loop through this area before the end of a drive. And for this wind we've experienced, it's actually been quite successful. We're so lucky to find a nice relaxed herd of elephants in the wind. Now, we know Karula's on property somewhere, but we haven't found any tracks today. A quick squiz, she might just be in this little river system to the west of the quarantine clearings. Now you notice we haven't seen much general game today. We haven't seen zebra, giraffe, uh, very few impala, uh, nyala, and that type of stuff. And in the strong wind, they tend to bed down and try try avoid moving around too much. Their hearing's compromised. If the wind's swirling, their smell's compromised. So they are more at risk. But as it gets warmer, even with the wind, they are going to be forced to move move out. But they will try to do that once it's warmer and the predators have stopped moving around. Now you can see we're driving down this little road here and Justin's wondering how do we tell the difference between a man-made trail and an animal trail. Well, strangely enough, Justin, most of our man-made trails 
would have started off as an animal trail. And that's the reason we put the roads where they are, because it gives us the best chance of finding an animal. But if we have a look, you can see very much the two tracks of a vehicle. And we have a look over here. There is very much an elephant trail. There we go, coming through the bush. Now, these crisscross. The roads are generally built on where the biggest animal trail used to be. So the one that was used the most by the most different species. So that's why we put the roads where we do. And they are basically, instead of being a single laned animal trail, they're now a double laned highway animal trail. hyenas went all around here so I just want to take a careful look and not only in looking on the ground I'm looking up into the trees maybe there's a tree climbing impala or dica around which will mean Queen Karula might have a meal I'm gonna keep checking very carefully around this area where those hyenas were excited and running about but while we do that, James is wanting you to have a look at his artistic skills. Now, as many uh, ardent fans of Safari Live will realize and know, I am an exceptional artist, am I not, David? Indeed. Yes, I am. And so I'm going to take these uh, six pens that I have in my hand, and I'm going to show you something about the low felt. Now, we often talk about the low felt, and I think many people have no idea what we're talking about. Why would you? It's an Afrikaans word, and the geography of South Africa is not entirely familiar to everybody. So have a look here. I'm going to draw it for you. Here we have the high felt, or those mountains that you can see in the west. Well, basically it does that sort of thing. Those are the mountains in the west, and they go down into the low felt like this, and they go along the plains, a sort of flat, gently undulating topography, and then up a little hump called the Labombos and off into Mozambique. So this is west over there. North is boring down into the middle of the picture. And there is east. Now, so far, so good, David. Do you see? Like right, I'm going to write a label here. D-Berg or Drakensberg. Right? And here, Labombo for the mountains there. Now, you heard Brent mentioning them earlier on today. He talked about the Labombo Mountains and the fact that Singita Labombo, where he used to work, was over there. Now, we have different kinds. So this is the low felt. Low felt meaning low, <laughs> unsurprisingly. Felt meaning land. And at low felt, we sit at about 450 meters above sea level, which multiplied by 3.3 .3 takes us to roughly 1,200 or no. 1,600 uh, feet above sea level. Okay, now all the way up here on the mountains, we probably go almost as high as 2,000 meters in some places, but I'm going to say roughly 1,800 meters above sea level on average in the mountains. 1,800 meters multiplied by 3, much too difficult, 36 is 72, so rough, call it 8,000 feet above sea level. Okay, roughly 8,000 feet above sea level. So you can see there's a massive drop-off down here. And it's pretty flat, gently undulating topography, a little hump there, the Labombos, and basically then we go into Mozambique to the east. And this is largely what we call basalt. That's the gen general uh, un underlying geology there. This is largely granite over here where we are. I must check this. I'm pretty sure this is true. And uh, these, the Labombos, are something called rhyolite. There are obviously lots and lots of other different kinds of rock underlying the low felt and that sort of thing. But that's the basic idea of what you have out here. Brilliant, don't you? I think it's my best map yet, well, mainly because there's only one actual line in it. 
I hope you've enjoyed our time in the tent today. We've had a wonderful time with the rover. Thank you, Alex, for your efforts there. Alex is huddling behind us. Uh, Connor and Eugene and Peter also doing a great job there. So hopefully we'll have everything up and running completely by this afternoon. Rover, microscope, all the rest. Thank you for coming to the tent with me today. It's been wonderful to have you with us. We'll see you later, and not this afternoon. We're on rehearsal again tomorrow, this afternoon, but tomorrow morning at 6.30. Until then, bye-bye. We've stumbled upon a nice young elephant bull. He's not quite as relaxed in the wind as those girls were. So we're not going to push him. He's moving away from us. We're going to let him do that. Oh, and the wind seems to actually be getting stronger at the moment. And I, it's always amazing how an animal as big as an elephant, who's got no actual natural predators uh, out here, it gets all nervous, jumpy, and scared in the wind. Maybe it's because their senses are just so refined that it's a, a sensory overload. Too many smells, too many sounds. Uh, but it always is a little bit funny when this massive animal sort of panics. Oh, I'm scared, there's wind. <laughs> Off they go. So far, we haven't found any tracks or anything around this block. And uh, of course, you will not be seeing us on the Sunset Safari today. We will be having another rehearsal and uh, very exciting. Uh, the Sunset Safaris on Saturday and Sunday will be live on Latio Wild in the States. And uh, very, very exciting for all of us involved. And uh, we will be having, of course, the Sunrise Safaris will continue. So you will see us again tomorrow morning, bright and early. And then again on Sunday, or on Saturday and Sunday, you see us all day. That's great. Hopefully, we're going to find some kitty cats. There are some tracks about, but in this weather, it's proved to be a little bit challenging today. ...are back. Now, Sally in Oregon is asking a question all of us are wondering. I wonder what the weather's going to be like for the TV broadcast. Well, Sally, I'm hoping sunny, but as uh, to quote Mr. Hemingway, there's two things one should never predict. It's the weather, and I'm not going to say the other. But I'm hoping it'll, it'll clear up. We don't mind it being cool, but we want cool and sunny. Cool and sunny and not windy. But whatever happens, we will make the most of it. And uh, we're very excited, whether it's cold and windy or sunny and warm, I'm sure we'll have a fantastic time and be able to bring some incredible animals onto the screen. And hopefully all the big daddy animals are gonna play along for the Father's Day weekend. And of course, I've had many magical moments in the bush with my father, uh, having walked lions for the first time, walked leopards for the first time, all with my dad. So, very exciting to be able to celebrate Father's Day out in the bush. And uh, he's probably not going to be watching. He's probably going to be a game driver of his own. But uh, he'll be with me in spirit. But from Brian, myself, the killer bees, and the rest of the Safari Live team, it's been great having you with us. And uh, don't forget to join us for the exciting Father's Day weekend special. But toodaloo for now.